Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath once more. And happy day. Yeah, it's good to see all of you. My name is McGovern Kamau. And I'm humbled to join you today uh, in, you know, Sabbath worship. We are already in the hours of the Sabbath. I've been coming here for the past two weeks for uh, the weekly studies on, you know, the Bible. And I think today is our last session that we are having. And I just want to pray that God has been able to bless us in a mighty way. For those of us who have been consistently attending, may God bless you so much. I've personally been blessed because it's not usual that you come to this place each and every other day in the evening. So it's been a wonderful experience uh, trying to come all the way to beat the traffic jam in town and then finding myself here. It's been a wonderful experience and I trust that God has been good to us. So today we will just have a, a final session and we have talked about so many things and this few days are not enough for sure to study everything there is to study in God's Word. So probably this will sort of encourage us to go back and continue studying just like the noble Bereans who went back and studied, you know, the Bible after Paul had talked to them. So may God bless us abundantly and continue to use us even as we come to church. I've seen so many, you know, groups singing as I was coming, you know, and I, I was really amazed. I was and I was telling myself, you know, this is very nice. You know, there are so many people who are singing and others, I think, are cooking. Others are planning to leave. I was like, this is a busy church. I can hear the many announcements. You have other activities to go on. So may God help us that as we do all these activities and as we, you know, are so busy in ministry, we may also take time to have some personal time with God. Amen? That we may not be overcome with all these activities and, you know, um, fail to have some personal devotions and commitments to God. So because of time, I'll just go right into what I wanted us to discuss for this evening, and then we'll come to a close. So since yesterday we have been talking about, rather yesterday we talked about health, and health is a distinctive teaching that we hold as Adventists, but we can't really uh, go into all the depths of health. Yesterday we talked about how important it is to lead balanced lives, you know, to take care of our needs spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and even physically. God would want us to excel and be in health and also, you know, achieve our goals. God does not want pain, physical pain, and even emotional pain to persist. He wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? And I pray that uh, that will be our experience. So let us pray as we get into our sharing this evening. Our dear Father what in heaven, we are so humbled before your presence. We thank you and we glorify you because you've been so good to us through the long week and you've enabled us to see a new day, the day of the Sabbath. Dear Lord, we pray that you may help us to have a special experience with you this day and that you may speak to us even as we usher in the Sabbath and you may guide us and protect us till it comes to an end. You use me, dear Lord, even as we share this evening, for I humbly ask this, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we talked about the sanctuary and how the sanctuary is a major theme in Adventist theology. Because the sanctuary actually has all the answers to all our doctrines and everything that we believe in. And if we can carefully study the sanctuary message, we can be able to give a reason for... Um, our faith to anyone that asks us. And so we would go back and continue to study that, but today we are going to look at the Day of Atonement. Now we saw on Wednesday that there were two services. There were two services. The first one was the daily service where the high priest would, you know, sprinkle the blood of offering of sin on the veil. Now that was on a yearly round or on a daily basis. And then once a year, same high priest, the high priest could uh, go to the most holy place of that structure, of the, the, the sanctuary, 
to make an atonement for the people of God or for the children of Israel. And so once a year, there was a special ceremony of putting away sin, of judgment, and those people did not participate. Those who do not afflict their souls and put away sin in a special way or uh, cut off, they, they ceased to be among God's people. And so today, we saw that we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. Since 1844, Jesus went to the most holy place uh, of the heavenly sanctuary as our high priest in a special sense to make an atonement for us in preparation for his second coming. So the early Adventists, I'm glad we're going to study about Adventist heritage, the early Adventists look forward, looked forward to the second coming of Jesus. Now there was a, a little disappointment in 1843, and then, you know, they went back to the prophecies, and there was someone, someone called John Snow, and as they were studying, they realized that was going to happen in 1844, in, you know, October. And now as they were studying, now they looked forward to the second coming of Jesus, in the clouds to come to this earth. The prevailing belief at that time was that the earth is the sanctuary. They believed that the earth is the sanctuary and Jesus would come to purify the earth, you know, by fire and then take his people home. And so, just like during the first advent of Jesus, when people believed, the popular belief and doctrine was that Jesus would come to be a Messiah and deliver the children of Israel from their captivity from captivity from the Romans. And so even the disciples of Jesus at that time, even Peter and his associates believed that Jesus would somehow overthrow the Romans and establish them as a wonderful and mighty nation. But that did not happen. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, their hopes were blighted. They were greatly disappointed. But as they went back to search the scriptures and they were illumined in their minds, they realized that the mission of Jesus was actually fulfilled as it had been foretold by his death on the cross and resurrection. And so they went out preaching the gospel of Jesus. Likewise, the early Adventists, they had it wrong in the manner or rather in the event that was to take place. And so instead of them looking forward to Jesus, going to the most holy place, as we read in Daniel chapter 7, they looked for Jesus to come to this earth. And so they went back to, to study and they were asking themselves what could have gone wrong. And we saw that on Wednesday, we read also in the Great Controversy, that the sanctuary teaching was the key that unlocked the mystery of the disappointment in 1844. So as they went back to study the Bible and the sanctuary message, they realized that Jesus was not to come to this earth, but he was to go before the ancient of days, God the Father, as their great high priest to make an atonement for them and to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. And so when Jesus finishes his work of mediation as our high priest, he was now to clothe himself with, you know, kingly garments and prepare for his second coming. If that's clear, say Amen. Amen? And so Jesus is in heaven right now, mediating, interceding on our behalf. And we, as his people on earth, are supposed to follow him by faith and participate and cooperate with him as he does a work for us. So anciently, the children of Israel, when you read the book of Leviticus chapter 23, God had given some instructions of what the children of Israel were supposed to do. Now, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27, it says, Now, uh, this was the tenth day of the seventh month, which was the day of atonement. Now, listen to the instructions of God as to the responsibility and the duties of the children of Israel on that special day. It says in verse 27, Also, the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And then he says in verse 28, And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. And so, there are specific things that the children of Israel were supposed to do on that day of atonement. 
So while the high priest was going to make an atonement for them in the sanctuary, they were not just to, to lie idle, they were not just to sleep, they were supposed to do some certain things. And this is very important for us to understand as we live in the antitypical day of atonement. Now, anciently, we have seen that, number one, the first thing that they were supposed to do is to have a holy convocation. God is good. God is good. And so they were to have a holy convocation. Now, what is a holy convocation? Or maybe we can start to ask ourselves, what is a convocation? Now, a convocation, according to the dictionary Oxford, it says it's a large formal assembly of people. So a convocation is an assembly of people. Now, now, according to the Bible, on the Day of Atonement, they were not just to have a formal assembly. They were not just meant to gather together and form an assembly of people. But it was to be a holy convocation. You know, people usually meet always in business rooms, you know, for maybe uh, business deals. Some people meet for educational reasons. You meet in your lecture halls, you know, to listen to a lecture or even to attend class. Some people meet in, uh, you know, this week I think you've been having some political campaigns and I used to come and I could hear people singing and chanting, you know. People meet and have convocations for different reasons. But now on the Day of Atonement, the children of Israel were to have a holy convocation. In other words, they were to meet together for a holy purpose. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 that where two or three people are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So we are encouraged that in the, in, the, in the typical day of atonement we are not to forget associating ourselves together. In other words, we should have groups where we can be able to have holy convocations, meetings where we provoke each other unto good works not forsaking the assembling of each other as the manner of some is, is, but exhorting one another even as we see the day of Jesus Christ approaching. Amen? And so we are supposed to have holy convocations. You know, sometimes we can get lazy, we can be discouraged. Sometimes we have so many things that are going on in our lives. And sometimes you can wake up, for example, on Sabbath morning and you're asking yourself, is it really necessary for me to go to church? I can simply... You know, I can simply turn on maybe Facebook Live or, or maybe some channel on YouTube and I can simply watch maybe what is going on. And I can somehow, you know, be spiritually edified. But there is sweet fellowship and communion when, when people gather together. Yesterday I was telling us that, you know, communication for human beings is not just uh, verbal communication. There's a lot that happens in our nonverbal language, you know, our body language our facial expressions, when we talk to each other in person, it strengthens our bonds. It strengthens our relationships even with each other as we gather together in person to worship God. And so we are reminded that in the antitypical day of atonement, we are to have holy convocations, you know, to edify and encourage one another with holy conversations and instructions from the word of God. And what a privilege it is for you guys that you can be able to, to meet almost on a daily basis to talk about godly things. This is something that uh, uh, when you leave here, you will greatly miss. When you can meet together with your friends, with your classmates, and study God's word. Uh, here I heard that you have studies in the morning on prophecy from 6.30 to 8. Now, many local churches don't have such programs. And you can take advantage of those kind of meetings to strengthen your spiritual life and to be ready for what is coming upon the world and even to be used by God out there once you leave this university. Now, when you read history, during the Reformation, Martin Luther, Langton, and all other friends of the Reformation did a lot of work in the universities. Many people came to Wittenberg from the Scandinavian countries and from other distant places. And when they came to Wittenberg, they learned the true messages of the gospel. And they learned about righteousness by faith. And they went to their places to spread the truth that they had learned. God had brought you uh, for a reason to this university. And I believe one of the reasons is maybe to get to know him 
to learn his truths and maybe to take to your native lands, to your communities, the light of the gospel that you have found. God did it then and God is still doing it today. So let us encourage each other. Let us have holy convocations, not to gossip and talk about others, talk about politics or talk about, you know, what are the latest trends, you know, in fashion. But let us meet together to talk about the things of God. Praise God. Let us meet together to talk about the things of God. I'll read a Bible verse in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. You can open our Bibles in the book of Joel chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. This is what it says in Joel chapter 15 regarding the holy convocation or the assemblies that they were to have. It says in verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. A sacred assembly is the same as a holy convocation. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. That the nation should rule over them, why should they, why should they among the peoples, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And so here, the prophet Joel is talking about a solemn assembly, or a holy convocation. And what is supposed to, to happen in that assembly? It says they should sanctify the congregation and assemble the elders and gather everyone. No one is going to be left behind. And the priests are supposed to minister to the Lord, weeping and sharing the truth of God. And the prophet actually says that they should sanctify the congregation. That means make them holy. How do we make congregations holy? By sharing and teaching the truth of God as it is in his word. And right now we know that many churches are starving for the truth. Because, you know, the people are not being fed spiritually with the truth of God's word. And so God tells us that in that typical day of atonement, we are to have holy convocations where the truth of God is taught with power. And people are instructed and they are encouraged to live holy lives. And of course the truth, to have effect in the church, must have an effect right from where we come from at home. You know, we must be Christians right from where we, become, we come from in the home, and then we bring it to church. So we must have some personal time at home. We take our Christianity from the home and bring it to church, and not vice versa. We don't take Christianity from church and take it home. Now, religion begins in the home. You know, how we talk to those people who have hurt us. Maybe your roommate. Maybe they, they have not contributed some monies for the rent. Maybe you are struggling. You know, how do you resolve those kind of problems? Are you kind? Are you patient? Are you someone that is easy to, 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 to live with? You know, right from our home with our siblings, with our parents. You know, has Christianity transformed us to the extent that right in the home, people can be able to tell that there is a change in our lives. Because if we cannot be Christians in the home, we cannot be Christians at church. And that is why a lack of Christianity in the home leads to a lack of true Christianity in the church. Because we, we read in the book Child Guidance, page 549, uh, it says, and this was a challenge to me as well as I was reading this, it says that it is a lack of it is to a lack of Christianity in the home, in the home life, that the lack of power in the church is due. If religion reigns in the home, it will be brought into the church. So, because we are not true Christians in our homes, in our houses, then we are not Christians in the church. And that is why, uh, you know, um, Abraham, he was such a great example because his religion began in the home. 
That's why the Bible says that I know Abraham, I know him, for he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. So Abraham was such a great Christian because his Christianity began in the home. And so these holy convocations, we are not to, to begin and to start having them in the church, but they should start at the home. So if you don't have a family right now, probably you can ask yourself, what kind of family would you want to have in future? Would you want to have a family where there is like devotions, you know, at home? You know, genuine, re genuine devotions, not just formalism, where you can exhort each other with your family members, where you can, uh, you know, break the bread, maybe as a high priest if you're a man, where if you're a lady you can be like um, a, a person that is able to bind the house together, you know, through your kind deeds, through your religious influence, you know. So religion begins in the home and we bring it to the church. And that is why we are told that the greatest Christian is a loving and a lovable Christian. And these things, we develop them in the home. You know, being kind, being thoughtful, being unselfish, we learn them best under the most favorable circumstances in the home. Because it's not such a struggle to give up maybe something that you loved and share it with your sister or with your brother or with your husband, with your wife or with your parent, you know? And as you keep doing that, then it's easy for you to develop other virtues, you know, of Christianity. So the second thing that they were to do on the Day of Atonement, they were to have a holy convocation. The second thing that they were to do is to afflict their souls. Now, what does it mean to afflict one's soul, you know? Now, if we want to understand the true meaning of afflicting one's soul, we will go to Isaiah chapter 58, where the Bible talks about afflicting our souls and fasting. And, you know, it, it describes a work that is noble, a work that you are doing for the sake of others, a work that you are doing to bless others. And so Isaiah 58, we will not read because of time, it describes, you can go and read it at your spare time, Isaiah 58 describes a work of true affliction of the soul. It is the work of self-denial, you know, denying oneself and sacrificing oneself for the good of others. It is the work of overcoming sin. So sometimes um, Isaiah, you know, asked a question that you say that you are fasting, but I don't want your fasting. And then he answers by saying that this is the true fast that the Lord requires, you know, of doing good deeds, of visiting those who are sick, of encouraging those who are discouraged, of, you know, showing empathy to those people who are very, having various struggles, and we looked at that, at that yesterday, and losing the band of wickedness. In other words, you know, overcoming sin, that have, the sins that have easily, you know, um, brought us down, like the evil habits, you know, the slavery to sin in the world. God wants us to overcome this, and this is what it means to afflict the soul in the antitypical day of atonement. This is what the children of Israel were doing when the high priest was in the most holy place making an atonement for them. And that is why Jesus says that he that will be my disciple, he must deny himself and take up his cross and do what? And follow me. It's Matthew 16 verse 24. And so the true fasting which we should be doing in the antitypical day of atonement uh, also includes, you know, taking care of our health. We looked at that yesterday and, you know, abstaining for, for, from that which is harmful and, you know, just ensuring that we are in good health physically, emotionally, mentally, in all spheres, that we can be able to be a blessing to those around us and also take care of our well-being. So also a work of self-examination, afflicting one's soul. You know, sometimes if we can do some self-examination, on a daily basis or even once in a while, we would actually realize how we have, you know, been we have been uh, experiencing some spiritual declension. When we remember how we used maybe to study, or how we used to pray, how we used to be so committed to, to God and how we used to love spending time with Him, and we realize that we're not doing that anymore. Or somehow our, our zeal has, you know, gone down. 
that will be as a result of some time for self-examination. So 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 tells us that we should do some self-examination. So we should do that in the typical day of atonement so that we can realize how far probably we have drifted from Jesus Christ. Gospel Workers, page 100, says that God jealously your hours for prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. In other words, we have to guard jealously. If you spend some time during the day, you want to study the Bible, to pray, to do some self-examination, that is a good thing, and you should guard jealously those special hours. And God says that those who mourn, those who afflict themselves, they are going to be comforted. Amen? They are going to be comforted. In other words, God is going to provide a special relief. He's going to bind our wounds. He's going to heal our backsliding. And he will give us special grace to overcome in Jesus' name. Amen? So another thing that they were supposed to do, I want to rush because of time, is uh, the third thing was to offer an offering made by fire. I want to finish this uh, in, uh, by eight at least. They were to make an offering made by by fire. So what does it mean to offer an offering made by fire? You know, does it mean taking something, you know, and burning it? You can read the book of uh, Psalm chapter 50 verse 5. Psalm chapter 50 verse 5. Psalm chapter 50 verse 5, the Bible says, Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. A covenant made by fire is a, a covenant that has been made by sacrifice. You know, fire was a symbol of sacrifice in the sanctuary, you know. And so, early writings, to uh, maybe expound this further, it says, early writings, page 66, it says that the angel said to them, this is to the remnant, get ready, get ready. Get ready. Ye must have a greater preparation than ye now have. For the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce hunger to lay the land desolate and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now, it's a commentary on Psalm 50 when he talks about Jesus coming, you know, with great power and shall not keep silent. Continues to say in paragraph 2 that sacrifice all. Those people have made a sacrifice to God by a covenant. It says, sacrifice all to God, lay all upon his altar, sell, property, and all a living sacrifice. It will take all to enter glory. Lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where no thief can approach or rust corrupt. Ye must be partakers of Christ's suffering here if you would be partakers with him of his glory hereafter. In other words, by making a sacrifice made by fire unto God simply means sacrificing all to him. That includes our talents, you know, our, our intellect, you know. Sometimes we, you know, we, we really uh, tax our intellect to try and understand, you know, probably our, our difficult units in class. But God tells us, let us sacrifice all to him. If it's intellect, let us give it to him. If it's property or the talents that he has given us, if it's influence, let us use it, you know, for his cause, including self. But sometimes it will require sacrifice of self to do certain things for Jesus. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a holiday. I was told I usually go for missions. Uh, Caleb was telling me. And, and maybe it's time for mission. And probably you feel like I need to go and maybe do some things or I need to go and rest. So it will take sacrifice of your time, or even the time that you would have spent with your loved ones to go for a mission. It takes sacrifice. And Jesus tells us that in these last days, we are to offer a sacrifice made by fire, simply meaning uh, a sacrifice of all things that we possess and have. All things, including self. And that will be a great honor for us to do that. Because our Savior... Jesus, he sacrificed all for us. He left heaven. He did not see heaven as a place to be desired or a place to live in if man 
was perishing in sin. And Jesus knew that at some point after maybe 4,000 years, I'll go to this earth. And after the earth is created, I'll go to that earth and I will die a shameful death to receive and to rescue man. And so all those years, imagine he was just thinking that at some point I'll have to die a shameful death. But he did not change his mind. He took sacrifice for Jesus to save us. The Bible says that he became poor, that we may be saved. That through, our po- through his poverty, we may be made rich. And you know, there are so many Christians today who they only think about, you know, they only think about themselves. They only think about, you know, I want this, I want to buy this, you know, I want to pursue this, I want to do this, I want to do this. Everything is about themselves. But true Christianity will teach us to go out of ourselves and to do things for Jesus and other people. And of course, as we do that, we are also being blessed in return. Amen? And so, let us sacrifice. You know, Jesus sacrificed all for our salvation. And many souls you know, can hardly give even 500 shillings in church to support a godly cause. Now, in local churches, you see people being pushed to give, you know, to support evangelistic meetings. But when people have, like, you know, uh, maybe retreat events, you see people contributing, you know, 50,000, 20,000, 100,000 to go to the retreat. But if you, suck, you ask for some contribution, maybe to, you know, to do a, a, a meeting or maybe to visit people who are in prison, you will see how scantily people will provide those needs. And so Jesus tells us that in the antitypical day of atonement, we ought to learn to sacrifice all to Jesus. And so we must sacrifice all, just like that man who went and sold all that he had to go and buy a field. So we must sacrifice all that we have in order you know, to serve Jesus in these last days. Lastly, another thing that they were not supposed to do on the Day of Atonement, or what was supposed to be happening at the Day of Atonement, was that they were to do no work. So what does it mean when it says that on the Day of Atonement, they were not doing any work? And this ties with our last point very closely. So it doesn't mean like sitting down and doing no physical work or business, but it simply means not being indolent or being overtaken by the cares of the world. Right now, there are so many things happening, for example, in our country. Things are moving so fast, you know. Just yesterday, the, the vice president was impeached, and today another one has been put in. And, you know, we are being bombarded. There is Adani, you know, there is, oh, you have your units. Oh, and then you have a relationship. Oh, and then you are struggling. You need to buy supper. You know, all these things. You need to respond to your messages on, on WhatsApp and all that. All things, you know, we can be overtaken by what is happening. And that is why Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 21, verse 34 and 35, it says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come upon you or on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. It says verse 36, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so during this antitypical day of judgment or atonement, we are told that we are not supposed to be overtaken by everything that is happening in the world. Of course, we are not in heaven yet. We are still in this world. It doesn't mean like we should be ignorant of what's happening around us. Even, you know, John the Baptist, as much as he was in the wilderness, he knew that the tax collectors were collecting more than they should collect. He knew that the policemen were, were, you know, were corrupt. He knew that the Pharisees were hypocrites. So he was aware of what was happening. So even as we also live in this world, we should know what's happening, and that awareness should help us to develop a closer relationship with God that we may be able to escape all these things. And that is why it says in verse 36, that watch therefore and pray always 
that you may be counted worthy. So that means that before Jesus comes, unexpectedly to the inhabitants of the world, there will be some kind of accounting that is going on. Does that make sense? There is some kind of judgment that is going on, an investigative judgment. That is why it says that you may be counted worthy to escape. So that means that there is an investigative judgment going on in heaven right now, of which the day of atonement was a type. And so the antitype is what is happening in heaven right now. And so when it ends, Jesus will leave and then come to this earth. And he will come as the Son of Man with great glory, the glory of his angels and the glory of the Father. And so we are told in early writings, page 58, as we near a close of our sharing this evening, it says that I saw that the time of Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished, and the time can last but a little longer. What leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. In other words, as we see the things that are happening in the world, let us not be overcome with the speed, with the things that are happening in the world. Let us not, you know, be anxious and desirous to be on the move with what is happening in the world. The world is moving so fast. Politically, you can see what's happening. In America, there is a fight between the, the left and the right side, you know. And, you know, people are, you know, you look at Ukraine, there is war. There is, uh, you know, news like this, maybe a, another pandemic that is coming, you know. Then you hear that maybe there is, um, there is uh, you know, terrorism and there is war in the Middle East. All these things, as the children of God, as we see all these things, these are like signs. And as we see them, they should make us to understand that, you know, we are living in difficult and perilous times. Let us seek to have a closer walk with Jesus. Let us seek to develop some kind of religious experience that we may be able to stand in these difficult times. And so may God help us, just like he did in times past, help his children. May he also help us in these last days to be able to, by the spiritual eyesight that he has given us, to be able to see what's happening and to know what we are supposed to do. Other people may not tell us or may not wholly depend on people to come and preach and tell us, but we can do this at a personal level. You know, you can ask yourself, like, what am I doing with my life? Okay, I'm studying, I am pursuing this degree, but how is my life really? What are my, what are my goals? What is my purpose in life? What are my spiritual um, uh, goals? You know, what do I want to be? You know, how do I want to use my talents? You know, just doing some audit of your life and answering some questions, you know, some very important questions. And, and you know, Pray to God that he may help you to lead a meaningful life, spiritually and in all other spheres. So may God help us, because without him, we can do nothing. Jesus is our hope for this time. And when you think about the Day of Atonement, we think about you know, the investigative judgment and how people are afflicting their souls and doing all these things. And when you could think of that, you know, you could be overwhelmed when you think about your long catalog of sins. And maybe you can tell yourself, oh, you know, last week I did this, this week I've been doing this, and today I'm even sitting here, but I don't feel like I deserve to be here. We do not deserve to be here. All of us, none of us is fitting. But we thank God for Jesus. We thank God for Jesus because he has taken our place. He has taken our guilt and he has taken our pain and our remorse for sin to exchange peace and liberty and contentment uh, instead of all those other things. And so when we think about the judgment and, you know, the day of atonement, we can think about our sins and maybe we think about our sins that are written in the book of life and, and we can have encouragement 
that that is not all. Jesus is in heaven today and he is praying and he is pleading. And you know, I can see Jesus, for example, on my behalf. And you know, my sins are many in the books of heaven. They are written there. And Jesus went there since 1844 to intercede and to pray on my behalf. And he can say, you know, I know McGovern, you know, he stole, he lied, you know, he did this, and he did this, but I am here to represent him. And please forgive him because he has confessed these sins and he is making efforts to overcome them. So erase all those sins and on his record, replace it with my perfect record of life. Because I love McGovern and I want him to be saved and to be saved throughout all eternity. And that is the experience of each one of us. Jesus wants us to lead a new life. He wants to forgive us and he wants to transform us. And he can do all those things for each one of us. There is none that has sunk so low that Jesus cannot save. Jesus is more than willing today, this Sabbath, in 2024 to accept another child into his fold and that includes all of us it doesn't matter what we have done today yesterday the past year you can walk out of this church a new creature and you can walk out of that that place or this these doors and tell jesus i am a new creature i don't know how i'm going to live but please take my heart and prepare me for your second coming help me in this antitypical day of atonement, you know, to afflict my soul, you know, to be more desirous to have a closer connection with you, you know, to love holy meetings and holy convocations, you know, to sacrifice all that I have to you, and most importantly, you know, to live for you in these last days. Jesus is soon to come, brothers and sisters. And they will wait no longer. We can see everything that is happening in the world. And these are actually signs to tell us and to remind us that his ministry in the sanctuary in heaven is about to close. And probation will be forever closed. And he has time, a probationary time for us to put away our sins and to live as we should as his children. And so may God help us this evening that while he's still interceding above, while our sins can still be forgiven, while still we have the desire to know him and his ways, and to do that, that we should honestly strive to cleanse the soul temple from all defilement of sin. How can we cleanse our, you know, our, our sins? We cannot do that. We can only do that by believing that Jesus died for us and is willing to give us the gift of forgiveness and the gift of repentance that we become new creatures in him. If that's your prayer, please stand up. Jesus is our only hope for this time. And if we can have Jesus on our side, we have no fear of the judgment. We need not to fear what the devil can do to us because Jesus, who has overcome the world, is in us. Amen? We do not need to fear what the world is planning or what is going to happen in future because Jesus has already secured our future. My sincere prayer for each one of us this evening is that God may bless us and give us the courage and the boldness in him. Not in us, but in, in him. Because in Jesus, we are complete. We are complete in Jesus. May we learn to have holy convocations. May we afflict our souls. May we make an offering to God made by fire. And may we do no work. And I know you have understood what all those things mean. This is my sincere prayer to each one of you in Jesus' name. If that's your prayer, you can raise up your hand as we pray. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, Thank you so much for being with us since we began these meetings. And now, as we have come to a close, dear Lord, you've reminded us that we are nothing without you. 
Dear Lord, there's a judgment going on in heaven. And dear Lord, we need to cooperate with you, our high, great and most gracious high priest, that as you do a special work for us, we may also, dear Lord, cooperate with you, dear Lord. May you help us, dear Lord, in our struggles and in our shortcomings, that we may overcome even as you overcame. May you help us, dear Lord, to have confidence in you because you are willing to die to redeem us from this evil world. May you guide us, may you strengthen our walk with you, may you take our hearts and purify them and cleanse them that we may walk in newness of life, dear Lord, starting this day. Bless each one of us, and if there is anyone, dear Lord, among us ourselves who has not made a commitment to follow you and to know you more, pray that may you continue to visit us, may you continue to speak and to talk to us in a tender voice, that, dear Lord, we may surrender our lives to you, and, dear Lord, walk with you. Bless us to this end, for we ask all these blessings, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen.